setting this just for quality control purposes. No, so everybody else can can see this. So let's go quickly just through the dev team meeting agenda notes. And the current projects at this point for anyone who's doing this, seeing this, this meeting kind of from a high up perspective is that we are working primarily on a 3D printer. So that's the core work with the people from the immersion program who are now starting out in California. And we're trying to figure out the marketing thing and, and seeing if we can actually grow the project and continue getting more people on the, on the team because as, as it stands right now, um, so we, we're three full-time people and immersion is coming up again in, in let's say in about five months or April, May. So we're gonna try, try to do that on a continuous basis as a regular part of our program. Now I'll let Sarah and Alex actually talk a little bit about their experience. But before we do that, uh, just a couple more updates. Uh, as far as what's going on in the background currently, and that is things like Jonathan Takax. He's in Ohio, but he's working on a PVC version of the 3D printer. You can see some of his pictures. Uh, the 3D, um, the PVC version is attractive in the sense that you can print the PVC corners and then you can use PVC pipe for a low cost version. And I just published a bill of materials that's $250 for a complete machine without heat bed, still with LCD screen, but using PVC and really reducing the part count, uh, reducing the complexity of that $250, which may prove quite valuable for an easy entry level build. Uh, now, Abe is continuing to work on a power cube, and that's great work, which may have some applications to... Recording is on. Oh, what's that? Who did that? <clears throat> oh, who's, who did that? Recording is on. Is that a Jitsi function? What are you doing? Wait, I don't know. Did, Alex, did you do that? I, I was kind of clicking around between videos. No, no, I think I think that was me. I think that was me. Um, I am recording now. Oh, excellent! So, how did you do that? You you do that through Jitsi? Yeah, yeah. There is uh, here in the corner, right, right, bottom corner. There are three dots. Uh, four dots. Three yeah, dots. Yeah, yeah. And there, there is the recording. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's excellent. And where does that go to? To your desktop or then to a... Uh... It is uploaded to my Dropbox. Okay. Uh, maybe you can post it to YouTube so we can then see this later. But that's good. I'm, I'm recording it using screen capture, but that's good. I didn't even know about that. Okay. Yeah. I... Cool stuff. All right. So may, we, we'll make sure that we can get this up, up and uh, running. So Abe in the background is working on a power cube. He's been working on it for a long time, and that's directly relevant to the micro tractor and the bigger tractors because we can put several power cubes on the bigger tractors. Now, uh, the relevance there is that's recently uplifted is the idea that there's a pilot. Uh, so we're looking at a potential pi pilot in Ghana where we build a, a tractor, the micro track, in, in one day with 50 people, so 50 of the local people. Uh, and teaching them how to build the tractors through a local open source micro factory. So that's actually a potentially a really amazing opportunity there. And just got to write that up as a proposal and, and see if that goes through. Well, that's interesting work there. Um, what else is happening behind behind there? So there's some work being done on... Um, on a buck boost converter that is another word for power supply dc to dc converter and we can um yeah use that for the universal power supply that's going to be relevant to welders to charge controllers to solar energy uh, induction furnace and everything else but without going further let's since we only got through few of us here on the meeting. So, so Hermann was, he's um, in Germany right now and he's studying mechatronics, but I want Alex and Sarah to get on a box and t maybe tell us a little bit, because I know Hermann is, was uh, still interested. He's actually interested in applying to the OSC program in the future. We'll see if that works out. 
but he's studying mechatronics in Germany right now just to get some basic uh, work experience. But uh, he, he said that his heart is really in co community economic development. He wants to co go back to, to Argentina, where he's from, to actually do some of this good work where he says people are pretty depressed in general there. Uh, but uh, let's see if we can make, uh, you know, how far we get on the open source microfactory and, and making that available to everyone. But maybe, um, Herman, do you have do you have some specific questions about like what's what what are the most pressing questions you have for the results of the immersion program? So for Alex, um, I'll, let, I'll let Alex and Sarah talk about their experience. Um, yeah. Yes, I am. I am intrigued more than anything in the overall overall experience. Uh, whether the expectations were um, met, uh, were met, or. Um, yeah, just just to have an idea of the of the feeling, of the feeling also because uh, I, I see it as, a, as an amazing uh, amazing opportunity, it's something so out of the out of the common. Um, so I just want to hear about the experience, what what the and what they are, how they are seeing themselves after the experience in the future. How how do they see? Uh, yeah, how do you see yourself, Sarah and Sarah? Um, yeah. Alex, what else can I say? Alex and Sarah, do you guys have any comments regarding that question? <laughs> I guess. Uh, I mean, main, I guess uh, some of my main takeaways from the immersion experience. Um, one thing that was actually pretty big for me is I better understood the open source ecology philosophy like I think I had I still had some like misunderstandings about like the nature of the product ecology and how machines make materials uh, machines make machines machines make like useful stuff and how the, like, the design of the critical path sort of revolves around that and like there's nothing special really about transforming materials into useful things and I was like pretty poor. And um, there were like little like misconceptions just about open source and like how that um, is situated in the field of like makers and open source and open source software and stuff like that. That was like informative for me. And then, um, and like, just me coming in to it. I mean, why I'm here at Open Source Ecology is just, I wasn't, like, I'm a software developer. And I'm also an organizer for, I guess, like, Asian diaspora identity based stuff in America. And, uh, like, I did some healing, healing justice type stuff. And uh, like wanted to do more like resource based things since I think there's a shortage of that. I guess at least organizing that so fun here. And um, yeah, in terms of like the experience and whether it met my expectations, I think um, like there were a lot of really good takeaways in terms of like how you organize a workshop so that everybody like can follow along, nobody gets lost, everybody's working together. And I think that's how we're gonna organize the three printer workshops based on how we learn during the immersion experience. But in general I think a lot of things definitely went wrong during the first week especially where I guess a combination of uh, changes in the supply chain leading to an incomplete documentation really leading to a lot of rework in terms of like oh this part isn't working and there's a lot of like rumors about like what would work and like there's like 20 people I guess being built simultaneously with kind of like an untested supply chain and like complete documentation so it's really messy and then the other thing that was messy also about 
the first week was since we got behind schedule and in an attempt to always catch up, we, uh, there wasn't really enough space for people to just like express what their tensions were or to be seen or heard. And I think a lot of people developed a negative attitude towards, I guess, open source ecology in general, which eventually we were able to like, hold space for that on the last day of the first week, where uh, we basically held a circle, which is a type of decision-making group, like, scheme process from indigenous people in America that's been around for like hundreds of years. But I know how to uh, hold that space. So I'll be able to facil not facilitate, but just like hold a circle for, I guess, people to be seen in that way. It led to people really walking away with being able to see what the best parts of at least the first week was, which is like being connected to lots of really good people. Who, like, although they come from different backgrounds and like motivations, so really a lot in common, like being something really valuable in open source ecology stuff. And uh, I think most people walk away from very about the experience. Um, and then like in terms of like the four weeks after that, where it was just uh, me, Sarah and Dixon and a PhD student. There was also three other people who were originally part of the like five week immersion, but who dropped out because they felt like their expectations weren't met. Because I think the, the description of the workshop curriculum uh, was complete, but they didn't really understand that that was aspirational rather than um, like a kind of like tried and true sort of like process or anything. And they weren't able to take that amount of this at their like time in life where it's like, yeah, we actually needed to be completely looking forward. This is kind of being there and like like this is where it's at, this is what the work is, like this is the starting place for looking forward. So I think that is the best perspective there. Like whether people are really ready for but yeah, like the process of the Four weeks was just a lot of the same, but like working through a lot of the like issues and just like documenting things was a lot of work. But I think the basic process is just like really laying the foundation. Uh, um, how to work together in like. Uh, so it was it was a bit of a of a rough rough start but at, at, at the end things sort of found their own level huh? yeah yeah for sure and a key thing that happened i think in the dynamic of our team is we um formalized ways of um we formalized processes to decide really what we were going to do next um because, yeah, at some point, like, it became apparent that there was a lot that we could do. There was a lot that was envisioned for the program. Um, but we came together as a team and kind of narrowed it down to, you know, like, what is the path that leads to our goal? Um, which in this case, in this semester of the program, the goal is um, to hold public 3D printer build workshops. So we ended up really focusing on that in terms of the work that we were doing and in terms of the knowledge that Alex Dixon and I kind of downloaded from Marching the Brain, you know, we, we um, collectively decided and agreed to really just throw out a lot of the curriculum and focus on, on you know, these, these key points. Um, but even within that, you know, we, we also um, you know, just explored to a lesser extent a lot a lot of the curriculum that was there um and also like in different ways like just being at factory farm and living there in the hab lab um together for five weeks and spending all that time with march and katarina um 
you know, to be kept for the CD go home. We became exposed to a lot of the um, the physical infrastructure that exists and how it all ties into the open source ecology philosophy and like why it's being created and why it's there and why factory farm um, is being stewarded to become, you know, world class resource facility and community for visioners of the open source world. Um, so at this point, you know, it does require um, vision and conviction in oneself to see the end from the beginning, because we're absolutely at, at the beginning. Privilege. Um, in terms of our access. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely very true. You know, like not everyone can take access for that with shared. Um, so our work right now is largely to make it more accessible. You know, we want to uh, use our time and our resources to do this project forward so that it can take in more people, more contributors, in a way that supports them. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, uh, uh, in terms of like focusing on the community workshops, the main reason for that is, um, like the main reason for that is actually to support us as fellows to work full time to do research on the critical path so like the exact like revenue model like right now it's speaking from your workshops doesn't matter that much what's more the most i mean it does matter in a sense of like getting the technology out there teaching people and starting to create like support structures for people to start prototyping like their world like infrastructure and scale infrastructure stuff like that is obviously really important but sort of the functionality is in order to support us to work full-time on doing critical path research so like designing the filament maker for the extruder or just like other parts of currently the micro factory like the laser cutter and the um, CNC circuit mill, just like you know, those out of the prototype stage into a stage where you really can like equip people with a micro factory to like small scale enterprises to like start having an open source economy. When it's a complete set, it's a lot more powerful than just 3D printer. The thing that's closest to being out of the prototype stage. But uh, and then the other thing I think is informative to hear about is um, the governance process just briefly um, based on the um, like decision making like process of holacracy so we're not running for holacracy right now holacracy is a governance system that was created in the 90s by Zappos, which is the largest company in the internet. But it's basically a way to distribute responsibility so that um, people at the closest to the work they are the final decision makers on the work that they are responsible for. And then people at higher levels mean like higher strategic. So it's a way of um, distributing decision making power so that you don't have really long meetings trying to. Uh, it's a higher up person who doesn't have a good it's basically just creating the right level of projection but they have a really nice decision making process where basically you do a proposal uh, appreciation for the person who made the proposal clarifying questions and then reactions feelings and cross talk followed by deciding to pass the proposal based on um, whether they'll want to block it. So if nobody wants to block it and it passes. It, so it has a lower threshold for decision making. It's not trying to get an ideal, it's trying to move forward quickly and revisit it through an iterative process. The decision making structure that I use at a startup in New York City, I'm personally very familiar with it, and uh, that's been a way we've been able to make decisions with the group 
uh, not necessarily for all decisions, but for things that impact sort of like how the processes of the organization are structured at a fundamental level. For things like like work sessions, that's just sort of free flow, so it's not super regimented for everything. That, that does like provide some structure for sort of like really high level things, like okay, like what are the big things we should cover during the uh, What are um, like routine things? And that's all I have information. And that, that was really good. I think that provided a lot of, like, kind of like uh, a way where I think me, Sarah, and Dixon can be heard in, like, uh, in a way where, like, marching can be you know, Like, as people who don't necessarily know everything about the open source ecology, we can still have, like, a process. As a team, that's like. What what um, what was your original motivation to take part take on on this on this project? Why? How did you come across it, and and how is it that you? thought, okay, this is something that I have to try out, or this is for me, or what was your your ground? You, yeah, what motivated you? Yeah, what motivated me was the, the big vision of course ecology. Um, I, um, I was looking for organizations that are kind of revolutionary in their approach to um, building culture, um, building that can support humans outside of kind of mainstream corporate um, America, in my case, you know, for being here. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what motivated it for me. Um, I've been doing that kind of work for four years now. I spent three and a half years living in the village um, for the same reason, you know, with the and developing alternative communities and lifestyles to support humans and um, support humans in creating lifestyles that allow us to kind of transcend the artificial scarcity that exists um, and actually live fulfilling lives and actualize ourselves as individuals. Um, and the long term vision of open source ecology is all about that, you know, like empower people with the process of manufacturing, um, destroy artificial scarcity, and get to the heart of what the human really is. Um, you know, living in, in community with each other and, and expressing our creativity and the artists and us, the innovators. Um, for me, I guess I wanted to develop a technical skill to respond to perhaps climate change. That's an important goal for me, I think, uh, to do that. And then, uh, the editing, I sort of mentioned it earlier, but yeah, just like as an organizer, um, like the kind of organizing that I prefer is organizing that where the community builds its own capacity to make things happen. So there's a lot of like activism where you're really requesting resources from the state or like some other body and when you do that you know there's not a correlation between effort and outcome it's really based on somebody else's decision and, and like i don't think that's like a good best use of energy it's like kind of work that i think is really good is where like the community itself has the power to um, like nature. There's like healing and transformative justice type stuff where it's like people can heal from trauma based on like stuff that they know how to do. And then like I also think open source ecology, like that stuff is really good for feeling good, but it's not really good for um, like changing like resource based trauma. 
or stuff like that, or just changing the material conditions. And I think like open source ecology is a really uh, potentially very important way to start doing like resource based, community based, like that kind of work. So it's just like power from the people. It's like something that where how much you do it is how much you get. So I think it's like, just like, yeah, there's a lot of work, but it's pretty um, definable. Like, seemingly when it seems like a thousand engineers like that can be done years to just like do all the work that's already been done. We're not like discovering new things, we're actually just re specking um, like known things. Not, there's a lot of prior art. Very cool, just laying the foundation to like figure out like social infrastructure where people come together and like coordinate, um, like spread the know how. Like to me, it's, you know, there's a lot of work right now, and there always will be a lot of work for at least in the two years, but it's like, yeah, it's super worthwhile. At least, at least for a couple of uh, lifetimes, enough work for a couple of lifetimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you, I don't know if I understood very, very well because sometimes the audio is, is not all that good. But you say that a couple of people got a bit disappointed because it was not the, this this program was not what, or what they found was not what what they, they were expecting. Um, what what do you think is the cause? Uh, do, do you think the expectations were too high? Why do you think could be the reason for a person to come with such high expectations when, <clears throat> yeah, there is really, uh, but there is a see is pretty much is there to to find when one goes. Um, what what did they have in the head that they got disappointed? When they got there? I mean, the original promise of the was to uh, build uh, not just the Google Center, which is what got built during the first week immersion, but also the laser cutter, the um, grinder. Uh, I think, like, a lot of things were expected to build during that time. And, um, I, we did build, I mean, over the five weeks we did in the building that. Grinder, kind of classic, but it was one that was already partially built, so really do the whole build. Um, so like the basic expectations of, I think like that was one of the learnings, which is really emphasizing how a lot of things are aspirational, or being able to set expectations on the open source ecology side that like here's what we'd like to do. Here is what we have done. These are prototypes. Like, we may not get to everything. Uh, we have a history of being like a little late. Uh, that's all I can get to. I think most of the misunderstandings, I think, were it was like from two, two points. Um, one was how OSC set expectations, and the second one was. Um, not really providing space for people to like really chat about how things were going and things sort of veered off the path that was like that was described at the beginning. So things sort of like this is the way we wanted to go and things sort of like meander in a different way. Like it wasn't really discussed sort of like why that was happening. It was just like, well, let's just try harder, let's get there faster. And, uh, I think those two things let people to get upset. I will add, um, I do agree with all that, um, but I'll add that um, I think a third reason is that people come with all of their preconceptions that are often based on or come from it's a very developed world of corporate culture or 
or you know businesses, for-profit businesses that have a lot of money and have, are well established. And um, as you know, like there's a lot of ethical concerns about how corporations become as big as they are. Um, and so the foundation of open source ecology is a hundred percent contrary to that. Um, so you know we don't have that level of sophistication in our development right now um, because we have not compromised. So um, for the people who stayed through the program, um, I think that one common thing in all of us is um, the visioning element. So, um, you know, like myself personally, I'm like, yeah, like, I find comfort in the fact that, like, we're not in some posh, like, conference room doing our work. Like, that's fine. You know, like, at Factory Farm, you get real life. Like, you just get real life and you get genuine work being done for the purpose of creating a better world. And that's, like, the state of our planet is the fact that this is how far along the project is. And the fact that people are going to throw that out with the bathwater is a testament to um, the level of willingness and to, to kind of do the work that needs to be done right now. Um, so, you know, we all, have, we all make that choice for ourselves and we all you know, look at our lives and say, well, am I ready for this or am I not? Um, but it definitely requires vision. And it often requires throwing out those preconceived notions of, of what it's going to look like. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, it's something that's, it, it works better in, in large numbers, which is, is not what happens at the moment. There is no the, the, there are there is no such large number of of, of people still already involved. Um, one of one of the questions that I have for you is, is considering where you come from and what you have seen during the, these, um, these five weeks, how, how will you promote the idea of, of open source ecology of a distributed economy um, in, in, a, in a country like, um, for example, I give, you, I, I give you a rough idea. Uh, I am new here in Germany. And I, I only learned a couple of months ago that they, that they have something here that they call social market economy. And this social market economy uh, allows the, yeah, the offer and demand to work the way in the market. But there is an obligation towards the social side of, of things. So when you... Um, uh, when you start a business or when you work for a company, you have the obligation to pay uh, for the people that is not able to participate in this market economy. So you must pay, there's, there's five mandatory uh, insurances that you have to pay. And those cover, for example, a house for those who cannot afford the house, uh, cover uh, um, health insurance uh, for those who cannot cover health what, what you get as a result is a population that is very comfortable where they are. There is no instance where you are wondering whether, where is everything going, that the they have they have so many insurances, so many securities that at the end of the day, uh, what I want, what I wonder is, since I am here is how do you get these people or people in this sort of, of society to think um, at the uh, um, sorry my my English is a little bit rusty at the moment because um, I am struggling with German. <laughs> Um, but yeah, how do you get these people to, to question themselves, where they where they they are standing, and 
and whether we are uh, they are heading or they, we are heading in the right direction or if there's something that needs to be changed. Um, are you asking with respect to welfare programs, like what their merit is? No, no, no. What I what I mean is, so how do you get people that live comfortably, that has no real worries in their lives, uh -huh. uh, because there is a system that provides everything that is needed, but because you are at the end of the day. For example, if I, I were to depend on this social assistant, I get everything that, that I need, basic needs are covered, but I cannot go beyond. There is no room for globalization if you want to go uh, to that extreme of things, as Sarah uh, had yeah, mentioned it before. So you, you get only to this point. Your basic needs are covered, but there is no chance. For you to go past that point. Hmm. So how do you get a, a person that, that leaves the situation first to, to recognize that uh, they could be in a better place and that there is a, an opportunity in open source ecology? Yeah, I think the way it works with uh, sort of like the nature of the critical path as well. As we build more of the machines that, um, like the the stuff that people can get out of it, and the number of people who can like really benefit from it today grows as you build more machines. So like, like you know, right now, sort of the the big like short term milestones are finishing the micro factory. Um, finishing the, the heavy machinery stuff, and then being able to build an eco home in schools. So, like that's sort of like. But even after that, there's like being able to like make solar panels for like aluminum. You know, like there's extra levels of stuff that comes up later on, but more people can make use from that. And I think like. As with any business or like social change projects, you really just start with the people who are ready for the change. But like, and those people are probably like with the nature of this change too. Like, it's not just the technical innovation; it's also the social innovation. So it's like, if for instance, students that are part of the metro factory, there's the uh, grinder and the oven maker. So like. Those sort of create a small ecosystem for the 3D printer because the grinder sheds plastic, it fits the filament maker, which makes melanin the 3D printer can use to make new objects. And, um, like, I know that there's already really good recycling in the me, so there's not, that's not necessarily relevant, but at least in the US, uh, when it might be that good recycling. Um, like, that could be a thing, like, with just a 3D printer alone, maybe a lot of people wouldn't care, but with the addition of more machines, like, a school that wants to teach children how to, like, witness recycling, a recycling ecosystem, you might, like, use that. And that could be a seed for some, like, bigger project. And so, like, I think the main thing isn't to focus on people who have the most well, uh, who are the most comfortable, and like I can make them change. I think the main thing is like, and that kind of thing is like for people who kind of see an opportunity as like an entrepreneur um, to create a new way for people to interact and like change the community around them. So I think like starting with people who are on the edge of already being ready for this. And then as more machines come in, more and more people will be able to benefit in more and more ways. That's how I think. 
But does that answer the question? Like, is that going at the question that you're asking, which is what I'm hearing is how do you get... Uh, did I answer it? Because I thought you asked a different question, which is how... Short sure. answer, it's like later. Basically. Later. Like, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. In, in part, that's answered the question. It's, it's, it's the mother of, of time. The mother of time <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's again a, a, a thing that has to do with the number the numbers. Um, again, the, the more people involved, uh, the more contagious it becomes. Um, uh, the the movement, the open source movement here in Germany is is a lot bigger than what I expected. Um, despite the, the this. this Stability that I see as a, as a uh, not so help thing, um, but uh, um, I am I am participating. I am involved. I'm not doing anything actively, but I am listening constantly, reading the um, the messages that go back and forth in in a couple of groups from the open source movement and open source ecology in Germany. Um, there is a lot of movement there. There is a lot of people involved doing things. Um, most of these people, interesting thing is, are um, university students. So there is this also that um, recording is on. That they they have they have um, gather during the, the time in university that opens it in a different way that you, that you would in the in your everyday life if you were to do it just um, I, um, I don't know a day job uh, with the power of uh, and this is not to say that a day job will not give you enough uh, will not open your head but it depends on your surroundings the end of the day when you when you find a day job in a place where there is not much happening and nobody around you talks about all the things that do I have enough money to, to get to the end of the month or what car I'm going to buy next year when I finish saving my money then there is no really no real no stimulus no uh, so again, the, the words in English uh, are, um, are not there, but uh, I don't know if, if, I am, if I am making myself clear in what I mean is this, this uh, push that a person needs to be taken out of balance and start thinking about other things than just the, what is, is at the end of my nose every day the little things that are at the end of my, my nose. And yeah, what I see here is a lot of these people participating in these projects are people from universities. That, uh, in a way, this, this, this information has been, shut, uh, if not willingly taken, uh, at least sharp in their heads. And at the end, the questions start to come. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's just it's, it's a question that has popped up in my head in the last in the last few weeks. Uh, how do you get uh, more people involved, especially when people is, is comfortable where they are? I mean, I think I mean with open source ecology, like Martian did a very famous TED talk, and there were a lot of people who were interested in contributing to the project just based on the vision and my. Right now, open source ecology, in terms of active contributors, is a lot smaller than the number of people who have seen the TED Talk, or kind of like, even people who like uh, contribute money aren't necessarily, that is a way to actively contribute, but not necessarily in terms of like, doing the, like, research, or it's fine, but like, just in terms of like, what scope really makes sense for open source ecology to me right now. It's just 
there have been a lot of people who've come through. They're not here right now for the most part. And that's because, like, what I think a big thing is just having a better onboarding process that gives people the confidence and the skill set and the social support to, like, work and coordinate on doing research. So, like, even before you start convincing people who, like, aren't that interested or people who are interested, how do you support them? In There's a lot of them. There's thousands of people already who are actively interested. Um, and they're not here right now. It's, it's like, um, yeah, the secret, I think, to, to success uh, many times is, is the um, permanence in, in time that sometimes it's so hard to achieve. Uh, because many people has started, have started, and then at some time along the along the along the road, they must carry on going with what they were doing before or so, and the, the effort cannot be sustained over time. And that's why right now we're doing three different workshops so that we can make money so that we can do it. Fine. Yeah, I very cool. The very simple answer to that is that people come and go and at the point where they actually can start getting livelihood from the work that's when the movement has a chance to grow just like linux within a few years of, of this, their start they're funded by major corporations and and getting their livelihood made so i would argue that argument where they say oh yeah this is just so much fun and we do it for 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 our passion and no other thing if that passion is not met by revenue <laughs> then they go on to to working for whoever gives them the revenue and for the case of OSC it's the standard corporation that's our um, or just the mainstream system that we're competing with so unless we provide livelihood for people then it's going to be people coming in and out so and that's that's the reason for starting the immersion program so that's that's the current simple path of uh, for our strategy for growing that people who come in have to be making money doing this for a living as, as far as there is money uh, it will be necessary uh, uh, a little bit from somewhere to to get a little bit from somewhere yes it, it gets complicated yeah it uh, ha yeah it has to come from somewhere and our slow growth is the fact that we're saying well we're going to bootstrap this thing because that's a if you want to start a movement that's the only way you can make a sustainable movement that grows otherwise at a certain point you'd hit a bottleneck of growth which would uh, maybe in the short term it was okay we grew some but we want to we want to have a profound impact on on the way things go and i think bootstrapping is a good way to to do that it's harder it's much harder but it's a scalable way because you have to prove to people that it's actually working. You cannot be doing stuff that doesn't make sense, like people getting top-down funding. A lot of top-down top funded stuff does not have its inherent merit. It survives only because people threw a lot of money at it and that made it grow. But we're trying to not do that and say, okay, let's, let's have, see what things actually grow on their own merit. Yeah, I um, I was going to add something to that, but it just slipped my my mind. But yeah, I agree completely. Agree. Uh, the the thing is, you enter you enter now uh, somehow in the in a competition. That is what sometimes um, I I have a lot of um, I am I am averse to competition uh, many times. Uh, because it's, it's that thing that brings you, some, at the end of the day, can bring you again to where you were before, to this this race, um, this race towards a place where you are not certain if you are going to reach it or not, and uh, you may you may end up you may end up end up running until the end of your days. Yeah. Um, it's just a little bit of, of this, this philosophical thing that one uh, 
yeah, competition. I am competition averse. If you want to, <laughs> um, I I am scared of of um, of these things. Sometimes that's the only reason why I add these. Um, but yeah, effort an, an extra effort must must be must be made sometimes. Yeah. The question will be how for how long or yeah how big should it be to to achieve achieve the achieve the goal. Right. Yeah. Um. Something something that I was talking um, discussing with uh, Roseland a um, couple of months ago was. Um, they were taking. They are working here in this uh, solar solar box uh, system, and uh, they were talking about taking it somewhere to. I don't remember whether it was Pakistan or India or where. And um, and the the discussion went on. What? How do you? You were saying about uh, bringing this this tractor, the micro tractor to. To Ghana, did you yeah. say before? Yeah. How how do you um, explain the, the people in Ghana, or how do you know that this this tractor is what the people really needs? How yeah. do you? Yeah. No, I, I have no idea right now. Uh, it could be. Time check that we do have a, a 12 p.m. schedule. Yeah, so yeah, that's right. Yeah, we got to get going. But um, no, the, the quick answer on that is don't know. Except all I know is that we can try try to make a positive change. So the idea there is, believe it or not, it's uh, not for sale. The tractors are to be used by the people themselves, the farmers. So the idea was to train them how to build them in open source off-grid micro factories and and they run the production and they use them themselves um so that would be a interesting case if that actually works that's that's amazing but yeah i mean we have to pay attention to that like that's why i don't care you know like i care to work in the united states where i'm familiar with what happens like i want a tractor i know there's people that want a tractor here and stuff like that i have no authority to talk about what africa needs but if there's a program, so this is this idea is where the collaborators, they're they're interested in funding this this major scheme of doing that and spreading that widely across Africa. Um, now the thing that does attract me is if that that's a way to to fund development of open source hardware that anyone can benefit from, that's good. But beyond that, uh, I don't know. No, no definitely the, it's worth a try. Yeah, it, it is even. It always worth a try. Yeah. yeah, especially if it's charcoal fueled and locally produced, and we're actually getting to the level of of the induction furnace as being the next thing. Okay, but it sounds like we gotta get going though. Uh, Hagerman, okay. We've got our next next guy. That. But thanks a lot, and we'll uh, meet next week. Again. Okay. It was nice to see you all, and thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, thanks. We'll, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Ciao. Ciao. All right.